move on to members' statements. I recognize the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last Friday, I was proud to join the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Long-Term Care and my colleagues from Mississauga at the village of Erin Meadows in Mississauga to announce an investment of almost half a million dollars in three long-term care homes in Mississauga Lakeshore through the local priority fund to help seniors with complex medical needs like dementia and bariatric care connect to specialized care and support in their long-term care homes instead of in the hospital. Speaker, the Partners Community Health will receive $250,000 for wraparound support for residents at Camilla Care until they're able to relocate later this year into two new state-of-the-art homes in Speakman Drive, which were just named the Wellbrook Place last week. They will open later this year for 632 new residents. Erin Mills Lodge will receive $122,000, and Sheridan Villa will receive $110,000 for a variety of medical equipment. Speaker, there's three major projects in Mississauga. This is part of the $20 million investment in long-term care homes right across Ontario. Providing these services in long-term care homes will give seniors a more connected access to the service they need and also help to reduce the pressure on our hospitals and to all of Ontario have a better access to care. I want to thank my friend, the Minister of Long-Term Care, for his outstanding leadership and all the work he is doing to fix long-term care after 15 years of neglect from the Liberal government so our seniors can get the quality of care they deserve. Thank you. Further statements? I recognize the member for Spadina Fort York. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today is the 100th anniversary of Canada's Naval Reserve, and we are honoured to have senior representatives from seven Ontario Naval Reserve divisions in the gallery with us today. They will be attending question period, going on a tour, attending an NDP reception, and then meeting with other MPPs. On the 31st of January 1923, the Government of Canada authorized the organization of the Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve. It was seen as a great way for our young Navy to build support across the nation by establishing Naval Reserve divisions in major Canadian cities to bring the Navy to Canadians living far from the coastlines. From World War II to peacekeeping missions in the former Yugoslavia, Somalia, and the Sinai Peninsula, the Naval Reserve has played a critical role in Canada's safety and security as a vital element for the Royal Canadian Navy and Canadian Armed Forces. Today, as it celebrates the 100th anniversary, the Naval Reserve has 4,100 sailors across 24 Naval Reserve Divisions from Victoria, B.C. to St. John's, New Brunswick. They have been pillars in their communities where they're training in, in, uh, for service at sea or coming to the aid of their neighbours in need. Can we all join in giving a, a round of applause for the 100th anniversary of Canada's Naval Reserve? Further statements, I recognize the member for Ajax. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to say it's an honour to represent the people of Ajax. In my riding of Ajax, the Ajax Homeless Task Force, which is comprised of non-profits, service agencies and places of worship, is working to address immediate needs as well as identify long-term solutions to address homelessness in Ajax. <sighs> I have. <laughs> I have connected and worked with partners in the community who are supporting the ongoing needs of unhoused community in Ajax. I would like to thank Ivan Dawes and the iPad team for doing turkey dinners at the Backdoor Mission. I'd also like to thank providers like uh, Storehouse Community Food Bank by the Southside Worship, as well as the Salvation Army, who both provide hot meals and mobile food programs. Thanks to all those who help the unhoused community. Homelessness is a serious and complex issue, and our government, under the, pre the leadership of Premier Ford, is committing to continuing to work with municipalities and local service providers to supply solutions for the unhoused. Our government, and I'm glad to support this, is providing an additional $202 million additionally to help homelessness. I look forward to the supportive housing uh, initiatives that are upcoming in my community, and thank you for the house. 
Further statements? I recognize the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. Speaker, it's an honour to rise in the House to share the stories and the voices of the people of Toronto Centre, people who are seeing their lives get harder and harder while they're being shortchanged by this government's budget. I shop locally, I talk to my neighbours in the grocery aisle, and we lament the cost of a $5 loaf of bread, a $10 stick of butter, or a $6 carton of eggs. And for goodness sake, Speaker, if you can find baby formula, you'll see it, yeah, you're paying $60. Prior to the pandemic, the GTA's 128 food banks saw about 65,000 clients a month. Today, that number has quadrupled to 270,000 people, the highest number in its 40-year history. Speaker, Ontarians have learned that Galen Weston, his wages have increased by over a million dollars last year. But the budget, this budget, does nothing to stop grocery chains from price gouging hardworking Ontarians. The Daily Bread Food Bank speaker has reached a breaking point, and they are spending an unsustainable $1.8 million a month to buy food to feed hungry Ontarians. Its CEO is calling the province to step up and help to fight the high cost of groceries. Speaker, the budget doesn't even help deliver the, the help that food banks are asking for. It's time for real leadership, Ontario. Make the minimum wage a living wage, double the ODSB, crack down on greedflation, forcing Ontarians to use food banks. Thank you. Further member statements, I recognize the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to extend on behalf of all residents of Scarborough Centre our best wishes to everyone observing the sacred month of Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak. During this occasion, I would like to recognize the work of our many mosques in Scarborough Centre who teaches our children the value of peace, respect, equity, and tolerance, and not to mention help the poor and needy through their charity work. I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the incredible contribution and sacrifice of our growing and vibrant Muslim community that is positive, contributing to many areas of community, whether it's education, construction, medicine, business, or politics. For example, Mr. Mohammed El Kara Uni who's sitting in the gallery here today, who is joining to, sorry, a businessman who has changed, uh, changes to meet uh, the, I had a chance to meet him two weeks ago uh, at his grand opening of his second location of his Al Diwan, Diwan Bakery that specialize in mana quiche, this is uh, Lebanese mini pies, flatbread, and other baked goods. Mr. El Kara Oni. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who's next? Oh, wow, sir. <laughs> the next member statement the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, we need to invest in our schools. In fact, the lack of support for Ontario school boards, including the Toronto District School Board, in the 2023 education budget is deeply concerning. Our government's failure to provide reimbursements for pandemic-related expenses not only affects the financial stability of the board, but it also has a direct impact on the education workers who provide vital support to our students. With the potential cuts to nearly 500 positions, we risk losing the expertise and support of educational assistants, child youth counselors, and administrative staff who are critical to the success of our students. Many of my constituents have shared their worries about the already underfunded education system and how further cuts would only make things worse, Speaker. A parent in my writing, Bethany Lynn Rice, shared about her son. She shared that her son, who has an IEP and is diagnosed with ASD, he hasn't received any adequate support due to staff shortages leading to an unsettling year. Speaker, Bethany also shared about her daughter, who has been facing bullying, especially at recess, because there aren't enough supervising staff to supervise during recess. Bethany and so many other parents are worried that cutting more staff positions will only make things worse for her children and for many children across this province. We have seen far too many school safety issues over the past year as students transition back into in-person learning. Speaker, With these funding cuts, we also risk losing 
important mental health support staff who are critical to the well-being of our future generation. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next member statement, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. Last Friday, it was my pleasure to meet with the Saugeen Valley Children's Safety Village near Hanover in my great riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. The Safety Village hosted a community engagement workshop as its recognition event for receiving a Trillium Foundation Communities Fund, Resilient Communities Fund grant. The workshop included many organizations and members of our community focused on health, safety, and children. Big Brothers Big Sisters, Food Bank, Public Health, St. John's Ambulance, Lions Club, Launchpad, Keystone, and Women's House were all there to support the Safety Village. It was a fabulous show of support and a great demonstration of the community spirit in our Grey Bruce community. The Saugeen Valley Children's Safety Village is an interactive inter educational facility dedicated to aiding in the elimination of preventable childhood injuries and death. Children participate in hands-on safety programs. Have you prepared your children for a fire emergency? The Safety Village children practice dropping and moving along the ground. They hear and see a firefighter. They crawl across the floor and they get out and safely. It is a great learning experience. Thank you to Marilyn Rosner, the volunteer board, and the whole team of the Safety Village for your amazing work and your great contributions to our great Bruce community. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Oakville. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, this Sunday, April 9th, we observe Vimy Ridge Day. This is a day that we remember thousands of Canadians who fought and gave their lives in the Battle of Vimy Ridge. On April 9, 1917, on a cold Easter Monday in northern France, Canadian soldiers braved rain, mud, machine gun bullets to capture Vimy Ridge. This battle marked a turning point in our history as four divisions of the Canadian Corps fought together for the first time. It brought together young men in their late teens and early 20s united to fight for freedom. While Canada emerged victorious at the Battle of Vimy Ridge, it came at a tremendous cost. Nearly 3,600 Canadians died and more than 7,000 were wounded, making it one of the bloodiest battles in Canadian history. In 2010, Bill 19, an act to proclaim Vimy Ridge Day, was passed. Members from all parties in the legislature unanimously came in support of this legislation. Ensuring that we never forget the sacrifices made by these brave soldiers, this Sunday, flags at the Ontario Legislature will be lowered in half-mast in their honour. Among the World War I veterans who were there in Europe, my grandfather Robert Irwin Crawford. So let's take this time to remember the brave soldiers who fought to defend our freedom, our rights and our democracy. May they rest in peace lest we forget. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to share wonderful news from last Friday in my riding of Durham. Together with my colleague, the member for Scarborough Centre and the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development, we confirmed the wonderful news that Bowmanville High School has received $77,200 in grant funding from the Ministry Skills Development Fund for the purchase of high-tech machinery to better prepare our students for careers in the tooling and machine industries. Mr. Speaker, with hundreds of students graduating each year from Durham College's various industrial programs, this investment is an excellent example of our government's commitment to invest in the skilled trades and encourage the youth of Ontario to pursue rewarding careers in the skilled trades. Under the leadership of Premier Ford and the Minister of Labour, along with the valued partnerships of the Canadian Tooling and Machining Association and the Ontario Council for Technology and Education, our government is fulfilling its commitment to our youth to invest in new technology and invest in the skilled trades at the college and secondary levels. And I'd like to recognize all who joined my colleague and I, including the chair of the 
Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board Steve Russell, his colleagues and Mayor Adrian Foster, all of whom pledged to support our government's investments in a key industry that will create well-paying, long-lasting jobs for our youth and contribute to Ontario's prosperity in the future. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning.